Does this circle look familiar? Isn't it frustrating that it does so in times when there is enough technology to go to space for fun? Oftentimes, the root cause of this circle is B2B, namely the default internet routing protocol, which statically routes traffic to its destination prefix by a single path, despite the diversity in today's internet. Of course, this leads to suboptimal performance for end users, frustration, and a natural question. Can we dynamically route internet traffic according to performance? The idea of performance-driven routing is obviously far from new. Yet, despite several strong attempts, few practical progresses have been made. The problem is that enabling internet performance-driven routing requires scalable monitoring of path performance, flexible forwarding, and a readily deployable solution that would benefit early adopters. Despite its problem, the problem's difficulty and its long history, we believe that it's time to revisit the problem for three key reasons. First, internet application requirements have evolved with a sharper focus on reliably high network performance. Second, the available paths are increasingly diverse due to the increased peering and the establishment of internet exchange points, which of course were not there at the early days of PGP. Finally, recent advancements in programmable hardware open up the possibility of scalable monitoring and flexible forwarding. Aiming at attacking an old problem with a new weapon, I mean programmable network devices, we designed Route Scout. My name is Maria Postolaki and I'm currently a postdoc at CMU, and this is joint work with my PhD advisor, Lorraine Van Beaver, and Ankit Singla at ETH Zurich. This is the outline of my talk. I'll first describe Route Scout's operations through an intuitive example before I describe Route Scout's architecture and its data plane design. I'll finish the talk by describing our evaluation. So let's jump to the example. Let's assume that ASX is a stub AS, namely ASX does not act as a transit internet service provider to any other AS. ASX routes traffic to multiple destinations, among which ASC and AST by one of its two peers, namely ASA and ASB. Observe that both next hops are equally preferred, but BGP's tie-breaking results in all traffic to both destinations to be routed over ASA. Unbeknownst to ASX, the links between ASB and ASC and between ASB and ASD have particularly low delay. Now let's see how Route Scout will explore and exploit this opportunity. Route Scout runs at the edge of the network on a programmable switch. Observe that the other devices in ASX can be commodity switches. I mean, they do not need to be programmable. Also, there is no need for co coordination across edge devices of the same AS or across ASs. These design decisions make Route Scout easier to deploy in practice. Route Scout uses some traffic of its destination to test alternative BGP compliant next hops. Route Scout automatically learns these BGP compliant next hops from BGP. For instance, here, Route Scout directs 10% of the traffic to its destination via ASP. Next, Route Scout monitors loss and delay across destination next hop pairs and finds that while loss is low in all pairs, the path via ASP have significantly lower delay. So a naive approach would be to immediately move all traffic via ASP. Route Scout does not do that, of course. Observe that such a move would easily congest some link in the new path or cause oscillation, or it might not even align with the operator's goals. As an intuition, the operator might not be happy with shifting traffic from one next hop to the other unless the current performance is unacceptable. To deal with such complex objectives, Route Scout first solves an optimization problem to find the most suitable forwarding plan. The optimization problem gets as input the operator's objective, 
the delay and loss measurements of the pairs and the bandwidth of the direct links. For instance, in this example, Route Scout finds that it's best to route 90% of the traffic to ASC via ASB, while leaving 10% to monitor the path via ASA. Route Scout also finds that it's best to split the traffic to ASD equally between ASA and ASB. Route Scout decides that this is best because the operator prefers to load balance traffic as long as the delay gain is less than 30%. Having a clear forwarding plan, Route Scout actuates appropriate gradual traffic shifts in the data point. Concretely, it moves 10% of traffic to its appropriate next hop until it reaches the calculated plan. Having an idea of Route Scout's end to end operations, let's now look at its architecture. Route Scout is a closed loop control system implemented as a hardware software code design. To use Route Scout, the operator first specifies the prefixes of interest together with their typical traffic demands and the bandwidth of the direct links. Finally, the operator specifies her objectives, which can be conflicting. The software part, namely the control plane, first decides which traffic to monitor, and then it periodically pulls data plane measurements. Every time the control plane pulls the aggregated measurements, it also computes the forwarding plan. Namely, it decides which traffic to reroute to its next hop. To do so, the control plane formulates and solves a linear optimization problem. The hardware part, namely the data plane part, collects and aggregates loss and delay measurements for the control plane to pull and analyze. Finally, the data plane receives and enforces the forwarding decisions of the control plane. For the rest of the talk, I will focus on the data plane design and I will show how we made it scalable. In a nutshell, Route Scout exploits TCP semantics together with a probabilistic data structures to analyze the relevant packets, aggregate the measurements, and actuate the corresponding forwarding decisions. The first data plane component that I will describe is the loss monitor, whose goal is, of course, to calculate the loss rate per pair of prefix and next hop. To do so, Route Scout detects and measures retransmissions. But why is this even hard, you would say? One could just mirror traffic, right? Wrong. Because mirroring does not scale and it's also inflexible. But one could still store all received packets in the data plane. And then upon arrival of a new packet, they would just check if the packet is already stored. And if so, that would be a retransmission. But this scaled with the number of packets and thus could not fit in the tens of megabytes of SRAM, of SRAM in today's switches. One would think that an alternative solution would be to use a Bloom filter, store all the packets there, and then pull the data plane structure from the control plane periodically. This would also not work, and that is because it will stress the control to data plane link. A final alternative approach that comes to mind is Blink. As a reminder, Blink is a data plane system that detects remote failures via detecting retransmissions. One could assume that Blink can also sense retransmissions caused by congestion. Unfortunately, this is not true, as Blink can only detect retransmissions after the second one. Unlike all alternative solutions, our loss monitor performs monitoring and aggregation in the data plane, minimizes communications between control and data plane, and scales with a number of flows, not with a number of packets. To achieve this, our loss monitor leverages the fact that in TCP, every incoming packet foretells the header of the next one of the same flow. So instead of storing all packets in the data plane, our loss monitor just stores the expected packet for its monitored flow. In particular, the loss monitor uses account mean sketch to detect retransmission and a single 2D array for aggregating the results. 
this array, namely the loss aggregator, stores the number of expected and of retransmitted packets per pair of prefix and next hop. Let's now see how it works. Let's assume that the state of the CMS is the one shown in the slide just before packet one arrives. Packet one is just a regular TCP packet with a non-empty payload. The loss monitor first calculates the sequence number of the next packet in the same flow as packet one. To that end, the loss monitor adds the sequence number of packet one and its TCP length. Next, the loss monitor inserts the next expected packet into the CMS. To do so, it increases three counters. To find the indexes of those counters, it hashes the expected sequence number together with a flow ID, which is source destination port and source destination TCP ports. I have colored the fields that are used for hashing in red in the slide. When the next packet of the same flow arrives, say packet two, it does four steps. First, it verifies that it was expected by checking that all the counters in the corresponding indexes are non-zero. Again, it finds the corresponding indexes by hashing its flow ID and its TCP sequence number. Second, it increases the counter of the expected packets for its corresponding pair of prefix and next hop in the loss aggregator. Third, packet two cleans the CMS by decreasing the corresponding counters by one. The cleaning is very important to make sure that the CMS contain one item per flow regardless of its rate. And finally, packet two triggers the insertion of the next expected packet, namely packet three. Of course, after it has calculated the next expected sequence number. Now assume that packet two is lost after it has passed through the loss monitor. Thus, packet two will be eventually retransmitted and passed again through the same procedure. Concretely, the retransmitted packet, say packet two prime, will have the same sequence number as packet two and will try to verify that it is expected. This verification will fail as packet two has already been received and removed from the CMS. So packet two prime will trigger an increase in the number of retransmitted packets in the lost aggregator. Having an idea of how Route Scout measures loss, let's now look at how Route Scout measures delay. To estimate the delay of a given flow, Route Scout computes the time elapsed between its TCP scene and the first act. Recall that a TCP handshake starts with a scene followed by a CNAC from the receiver and the final lag from the sender. Route Scout sits in between the sender and the receiver and measures the time difference between the scene and the first act. While doing so means that Route Scout only measures delay at the connection setup, it also minimizes the noise from application level effects, which are likely to be more significant for later packets. More importantly, the delay monitor does not require bidirectional traffic. Similarly to the loss monitor, the delay monitor measures delay and aggregates the results per prefix and next hop directly in the data plane. To that end, the delay monitor uses an invertible bloom filter together with a 2D array. For each pair of prefix and next hop, the delay monitor stores the summation of the measured delays and their count. As a result, the control plane can pull both counters and calculate the average delay per pair. So let's see how it works. Upon arrival of a scene packet, its timestamp, say T1, is stored to multiple indexes. And the counters of the same indexes are increased by one. The indexes are found by hashing the packet's five tuple. Again, I have colored the fields that are used in hashing in red in the slide. Similar updates happen for every SYN packet. For instance, the SYN packet of this purple flow triggers similar updates at time T2. Now let's assume that at time, time T3, the first stack of the purple flow arrives. First, it checks whether the SYN of its flow has previously written in the structure. It does so by checking whether 
all values of the corresponding indexes are non-zero. Next, it tries to retrieve the timestamp of this scene by searching for an index among the corresponding ones whose counter is one. For instance, here in index eight, the count is one. Thus, the accumulator contains only the timestamp of T2. Having retrieved the timestamp of the flow's scene, namely T2, the packet triggers three actions. First, the computation of the flow's delay as the difference of the current timestamp minus that of the scene. Second, an update in the delay aggregator. And finally, a cleaning operation in the filter. Cleaning happens by XORing the timestamp of T2 in the corresponding indexes and by decreasing their counters by one. As a result, the invertible bloom filter looks as if it never stored any information about the purple flow. Having an idea of Route Scout's core data plane components, I will now describe our key evaluation findings. To evaluate Route Scout, we investigate the two trade offs one between the data plane accuracy versus the memory footprint, and one between the control plane's runtime versus its complexity. We have also evaluated the feasibility of our solution. To evaluate the accuracy of the data plane components, we run, uh, we run these components on Kaida traces. Observe that Kaida traces are not perfect. They also contain, snow, contain noise. This noise affects the component's accuracy over time. As an illustration, in this graph, I have plotted the loss in accuracy, namely the difference in the per flow loss rate measured by our loss monitor to its actual loss rate as a function of time. The different lines correspond to loss monitors with capacity of 640k elements and with a capacity of 160k elements. We observe that the loss monitor gets polluted over time due to the noise in the Kaida traces. As an intuition, flows that finished unexpectedly will be kept in the CMS, effectively increasing the false positive rate and the monitor's inaccuracy. The same holds for flows that have a retransmitted packet or a reorder packet. Still, a loss monitor with capacity of 640k elements, which correspond to 60, 125 kilobytes of SROM, will remain healthy for at least 30 seconds. Similarly, in this graph, I have plotted the non invertibility, namely the probability of the computation of the delay monitor to fail. The delay monitor will fail to measure the delay of the particular flow of a particular flow if, upon arrival of the first ACK of this flow, there is no index that contains only the timestamp of the corresponding scene. We observe that the probability of such a failure is less than 5% for a loss monitor of 640k elements. Such a monitor would need less than one megabyte of SRAM. To gauge the trade-off between complexity and runtime for the control plane components, and in particular for the solver, we implemented the solver in Eurobi and we ran it with variant number of prefixes and next hops. As one would expect, the solver's runtime increases as the problem becomes more complex, but it always takes less than one second. To test Route Scout's visibility, we have implemented Route Scout in both BMV2 and in Etofino. For the latter, we have, of course, had to adapt the two monitors to adhere to the corresponding hardware limitations. Please refer to the paper for more details about our implementation. With this, I conclude my talk. And if you intend to forget everything I just said, please remember just these three key points. Route Scout is a modern answer to a null problem and that of performance-driven uh, internet routing. It is designed as a closed-loop control system that leverages programmable data planes, and its data plane fits in today's devices, while its control plane runs in sub-second operating times. Thanks a lot, and I'm happy to take your questions.